This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So how did you get involved with the project? How did it first come to you, or how did you, where did the idea germinate? Um, <clears throat> or your relationship with Ed Neumeyer? And I, I had uh, just graduated from uh, UCLA Film School and was directing music videos, and had made a film there, and I heard that a package of films was being viewed by a junior executive at Universal who turned out to be Ed. So we had lunch, and we both realized we were thinking about the similar ideas. Uh, he was thinking about an android uh, police officer, and I was thinking of a project called Supercop, where an officer was being affected his mental stability by appliances that he put on. So we went, hey, and we <laughs> wrote this thing on nights and weekends in three months, finished it in December of 1984, and uh, it was a spec script. And thank God that Columbia and um, Fox passed, and we got it to John Davison, who took it to his friend Barbara Boyle at Orion, and they, they grabbed it. How, um, in terms of watching it now and what I remember seeing, and I should say, I saw it opening night. I was, at, uh, I somehow got into the theater. I was not, I was <laughs> not the appropriate age to be seeing this so film. So you grew your first chest hair? Yes, I, I think I was, <laughs> I was a teenager and I somehow got in and I remember the <clears throat> comedy, the, the roaring laughter and the notion yeah. that I knew that this was uh, a different form of comedy. Right. Uh, when it really was the beginning of a certain form of subversive comedy that then we are all so comfortable with now with The Simpsons really took it into television, this kind of parody structure of, of satire. How aware were you both that you were writing uh, a comedy or comedic action film? That's really a good point. Uh, Ed always said it has to be funny. Um, and he pointed to uh, a number of uh, dark comedy projects where Violence was followed immediately by laughter. Um, my, my sensibilities were more subversive, having protested the Vietnam War. So the media break things, Newcomb, and um, uh, that aspect was the humor that uh, I felt was su subversive and political that I brought to it. So, but that tone also of melodrama, or 10% too loud, I think Verhoeven ultimately embraced too, because um, he is all about showing full frontal nudity, there's nothing, he doesn't conceal anything as a, with his sensibility. Uh, uh, so I think it was a kind of perfect storm uh, of sensibilities. Yeah, Paul Verhoeven, let's talk about him. I, I read online that, that the original director um, was Alex Cox, is that, or, or was almost involved? Is that true or not true? Um, I was originally gonna direct it, and thank God I didn't, because <laughs> I didn't know enough, and, and Alex was only mentioned by Ed, actually, um, we interviewed George Cosmatos oh, and sure. um, a couple other people who were very inappropriate. And I suggested Paul because I, my, my theory is that Europeans and, and outsiders like people in the African American community handle violence and America in a completely different way. It's sort of anthropologically, if you look at um, Ragtime or Chinatown, the European directors. And Paul, um, because of Soldier of Orange, mm -hmm. I made Ed and John watch it the scatology and the humor, somebody's blown up with a hand grenade in an outhouse, um, was perfect. But when Paul read it, he threw it in the trash. He thought, oh, B genre stuff. And his wife, Martine, who uh, is a uh, psychoanalyst, pulled it out of the trash, read it, and suggested that Paul look at it again. And the other good stroke of luck there was that English was Paul's second language. So he hung close to us as writers. He would ask, How does, what does this joke mean? What does that joke mean? Instead of moving in and rewriting as a director or some kind of uh, misplaced auteur, he worshiped the script. It's amazing because Paul Verhoeven, this Dutch filmmaker, comes out of the 70s making films like Turkish mm. Delight, right? These, these highly um, sexual films that are, have no action. I guess Sol Soldier of Orange, but you know, for the most part about, about psychology <clears throat> and um, eroticism, and especially in that 70s period of, of, of taboo rule breaking. Sure. And, and, and I guess you saw some connection between that and this sort of critique of dystopian American action cinema. 
which is such an unusual, but of course that's what makes it work. Well, how did you get, um, was Orion okay with Paul Verhoeven? He was not an established studio director really at that point. No, it was his second, but he had, ha had done business with Orion. He made um, a, f a Flesh and Blood, which was a medieval film that made about a dime. Ed and I saw it in an empty theater over in, in uh, Century City. But again, um, it, was a, it was a piece of luck that we got him because it's so well directed. He, he, he deals yeah. with master scenes with wide angles. There's not a lot of cutting. Um, and uh, I think if Bertolucci, uh, Bertolucci's uh, uh, analysis of directors holds true that the Robin always sings the same song, Paul's stories are about palace intrigue. If you look at Black Book, the recent thing, sure, yeah. they're ensemble pieces in which much more, there's a political landscape. There may be personal stories with a lot of sex and scatology, but they really are um, about a sort of political environment in which something is being worked out. So again, we, you know, imagine George Cosmatos who made Rambo making Robocop. That would have been, we would not all be sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, let's, I, I actually, John Davidson famously, or somewhat famously, said about the film that he called it fascism for liberals, which I thought was a really unusual quote. What does that right. mean exactly? But that it was sort of a fascist fantasy for the liberal sensibility. So may, we could talk a little bit about the politics of it, that it is this hybridization between the ideas of a kind of um, uh, avenging force, but yet the force is not directed necessarily at the, at the crime element, although they are at the center, but at this, at this institutional critique, right? And that's the shift. Sure, I mean, so much has happened since then all the way up to Ferguson. So you have to figure, at least my feeling was that it was comic relief for a cynical decade. We'd watched Reagan, and I'd watched Reagan since he operated here in California, um, uh, shutting down the UC system for a little while, uh, being very antagonistic to the regents. Um, and then the deregulation during that period and, and ran contra. So I was ready. We had the mm -hmm. microphone, fortunately, direct, speaking directly to power. And um, uh, Ed came from a corporate world, so he understood the boardroom. Uh, and, and we both had our strengths and didn't know each other's strengths. And I think that together uh, combined for a more potent kind of satire uh, about the system. And again, in a, in a satire or a farce, everyone's playing it straight, like network. Mm -hmm. No one knows they're an, an idiot, right? Uh, and they just play it about 10% too loud. And, and again, Paul's melodramatic sensibility really helped with that, what I guess has become the graphic novel sort of portrayal of a story. And interestingly, I think we arrived at the graphic novel before it caught on culturally. That was another uh, sort of step we took in the right direction but the only graphic novels that were out were Judge Dredd and the Frank Miller stuff, the Dark Knight work, but it hadn't become this sort of Comic-Con deluge that we're now all right. sort of up to our, our eyeballs in. You know, let's, let's talk a little bit about the vigilante, the idea of the vigilante, because I know in the 70s with Dirty Harry, right, there's the notion right. of Clint Eastwood, uh, you know, do you feel lucky punk, right? This is the beginning of it. Then there's Death sure. Wish, right, with Charles Bronson. But all those films were very much about uh, a fantasy or fear, nightmare of this uh, criminal element taking over the city that the, in the 1970s with economic recession, the police were going to give way to chaos and the fantasy of the vigilante, right, almost from the old west, that they come and they restore order by discarding the law and just taking it into their own hands. But those fantasies were all about critiquing the criminal at the base level. It's almost a, sure. it's a it would be considered a right wing critique. Sure. This film satirizes that, right? That's was that the idea of it to kind of respond to it and say, well, the, here are the criminals. We want to see them die, but the real power is in the boardroom. It it, it fulfills a, a vengeance fantasy. I agree. However, you know more than we did in 1985. I mean, that's what's interesting about all of this. Even though we have certain political and cultural sensibilities. For the, 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 in hindsight, history can put this thing where you just very uh, 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 aptly put it. Um, but at the time, I think that, I mean, I was a student of the Vengeance films, and if you, if you notice in, in, in Death Wish, the main character is Paul, an architect. He's not an alpha male. Uh, Jeff Goldblum and a couple other guys rape his daughter and kill his wife, and he goes to Arizona to recover and somebody gives him a gun. So 
there's not this sort of revenant, they killed his dog, uh, then they said he was a bad guy, <laughs> you know. So um, our sense of, and, and I don't want to get too deep into the weeds here, but we really are Pleistocene people when you, when you come down to it. There have only been 300 years since Plato, uh, whereas before uh, language and money and walled cities, there were 80,000 generations of Pleistocene humans, which are not much different than you and I. So when I make a loud noise and you jump, that's the Pleistocene part, right? So below this Band-Aid of Plato and uh, uh, the, 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 the Constitution is a vengeful quivering creature, right? So I think that's where a lot of, lot of the, the fulfillment comes. It's, it's, it's nonverbal. It's pre, pre-verbal is the best way to put it. Uh, and um, you have to just, just be a good Buddhist to sort of get past all of that, right? <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about gore, the, the idea of gore as comedy, because this began in the 80s, early 80s, right when you were writing it, right. uh, really with uh, Sam Raimi, with Evil Dead, Evil Dead 2, uh, Peter Jackson in New Zealand, uh, and then the trauma films, which there's this, I, I, I'm curious if it's an intentional sort of moment to the Toxic Avenger, but the idea of a kind of toxic waste as comedy was, was being done in the trauma films, well, and it all kind of comes together it's a, here. It's a really good point. I, I think that Botine, Rob Botine, who made the suit, who did The Devil in Legend, who actually counseled Verhoeven to not show er- the gags at first. If you notice when Robocop walks in, he's behind this uh, frosted glass, then he's behind a chicken mesh. Then when the third act face comes on, we see it in a mirror first. And Rob said, mm-hmm. Paul, they will fall out of the movie if you show them this. So I think a lot of these things you're talking about were like uh, uh, new toys for ambitious filmmakers, the way CGI is now and, and, and the meta narrative. So uh, as plastic and blood and rubber techniques became perfected, people realized, wow, now we can do this. I mean, I set a, a guy's head on fire in a film that I made right after Robocop, which uh, you couldn't do a lot of until what you're talking about. Uh, uh, there were techn- technological breakthroughs that allowed us to have more toys and to sort of extend the storytelling range. I think that impacted narrative the way CGI is now. Yeah, in the 80s it was about a kind of graphic body horror that was taking place exactly. in David Cronenberg's films. Exactly. And, and, and I remember, you know, but the idea, what I think was unusual here was really the com- to make that comedic, that to say that underneath that horror there's, there's almost a slapstick comedy. I and mean, when the head came off, when, right. he, when he hits, uh, as someone who was there opening night, I was you know, barely in high school, the entire audience burst into applause. I right. mean, it was, it was a moment, I mean, of just, we can see this in movies and, and it's okay, this is great. Sure. It, it was almost it's, an unleashing. It's pushing the boundaries. I remember I watched Evil Dead 2 like this. Right. right? Um, right. And, and so when you see something like that for the first time, uh, and Cronenberg pushed a lot of boundaries as well uh, with this sort of plastic makeup and... Um, uh, also, Robocop was R. You know, we, mm-hmm. we had uh, an NC-17 th- uh, rating for a while. NC-17, you know what that stands for? Number of customer, 17. <laughs> so, uh, because the torture murder of the cop was way, went on way too long, and, and, and Paul's is such a violence nerd, it's almost masturbatory for him. Um, <laughs> but as we cut it back, interestingly, it became more pornographic than graphic. So what you couldn't see, if you remember in The Godfather, when uh, uh, the guy's hand is knifed to the bar, the garret happens under the bar, and we see the killer's face. So our, it's more what we can't see, which to me it defines certain elements of pornography or concealment versus the full Monty, if so that, that makes any sense. For first-time writers, you were very involved in the production. They really let you work with Paul Verhoeven. What was that experience like? How involved were you on set? It was really a good day at the office. Um, maybe it spoiled us a little bit, because yeah. again, there, there, there was no studio development. We were sort of went away and could make this movie with a lot of money. Right. Um, so you were on set for the whole shoot? Or? I, Ed was on set for the whole shoot. I was only on set for two weeks. Um, and I was supposed to direct a second unit, but I got a job directing a low-budget feature for Charlie Band, mm, sure. who did this trauma kind of gore, which, which we'd been talking about.
But I wanted to be there for the gas station blowing up because I had had this image that I tried to put in two other screenplays, Shell Motor Company, Shell Gas Station, Explosion, Flames, and Hell. The S gets popped off. So we shot it all, right? <laughs> and even the close-ups. And then in the editing room, Paul decided not to use it. And I, we almost got into a, like a physical fight. And, and I think this was sort of the limits of the cultural gap for him because he didn't understand what this kind of iconography, uh, the impact of it, even though he was sort of a wash in the experience of Americana and spoofing it, that, just, that one just didn't get in. Huh. Um, what was Paul Verhoeven like just in general as a director? What did you notice of his working style? Um, very intense, always shooting. Why aren't we shooting? Why aren't we shooting? And you know, like the IMAX film on Everest where they used every frame, we used every frame. There, there was no way to fix CGI with CGI. It, it, uh, there were matte paintings and Rob's work. And sometimes we rolled out on a take and we used the last frame of the shot. Um, we couldn't have had a better director, uh, really, um, because of his intensity and, and his, his energy. And you can see it, it's just, also the script, Ed and I really aspired to a kind of narrative overdrive. There should always be something happening either uh, with the B satire or the A mystery. Um, and uh, we just got, we were very fortunate to have him. Was there anything you wrote that, well, I guess we heard about the S exploding. Were there other elements of that you, that you were there not was, able to get there into? There was a fourth media break in which uh, um, the Benny Hill character, Bixby Snyder, is arrested as a pedophile. And we go into the hospital to find Lewis alive and there was another commercial, and I can't remember what it was. And in the sequel, uh, which the writer's strike canceled, and then Frank Miller wrote the sort of subpar Robocop 2, we had Bixby Snyder running for president, which is sort of what's happening right now, uh, if any of you have been following the news. Um, yeah, I was talking to somebody today who said making fun of Detroit today would almost just be too far. It, it, it's like at the time you were doing it, it, was, it had a satire, but it's almost now, it's almost sad to make fun of Detroit So today. much has happened. I <laughs> saw a, an opening, I was in New York on the opening weekend mm -hmm. and went to a, a duplex that was showing Full Metal Jacket next door, primarily African-American audience. And if you've been in a theater with uh, that kind of audience, they're talking to the screen, they're talking to each other, and they were in the shadow of the Chase building. So really, on some level, they, they could speak the truth to power themselves by watching the, the boardroom scene where the robot malfunctions. It was a really interesting to be uh, near the boardroom yeah. when, uh, with uh, an audience uh, reacting to that. You know, it's the, the idea of the cyborg, I mean, it really, the Terminator comes out a few years before. It is in the 1980s, the, you know, the post-human, they call it, right? The idea of, of assembling a body that's part technology really captures the imagination in numerous films. Uh, but what's interesting, when I watch Robocop now, is a lot of the assemblage of a kind of, and a lot of it has to do with the hyper-masculinity, right? This notion, even Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? Not just as the Terminator, but, but in all his performances as a hyper-masculine to the point of- The way of, the suit's built, yeah. the, the musculature, yeah. But this goes the other direction. This is a deconstruction, or essentially to regain his humanity requires a stripping away of the armor. And I wonder, was, how aware of you in relation to that idea of a kind of masculine archetype were you? And probably it's not. Am really I, good, Am Josh. I reading too much? <laughs> this is for no. my action cinema class. Okay, no, no, no but, the, right the, now, the but it does uh, get to a point about developing the script with Paul. The fourth draft, and, and for you writers out there, you want an odd numbered draft if you're gonna get a film made. One, three, five, because that's your draft, not the notes, right? So number four, Paul had had some input because he came on after the third draft, which we used to capture him, and he said, get rid of the family. He will be a bachelor, he will be having affairs. And I went, oh my God. And so I pointed to E.T. and said, you know, when, when you threaten home, uh, that's a, a very much an American thing with suburbia and, and, and this sort of phenomenon of living that we have. So to his credit, we put the family back in, which became what you're saying, the sort of more uh, the sensitive side of, of, of the, the, the gender issue. Um, also, interestingly, Ed and I worked really hard to make a sort of genderless locker room for the cops, down to the name of the police officer, Lewis, which is, has an androgynous quality mm -hmm. in the haircut and everything. And Paul embraced that uh, uh, 
very quickly. Yeah, and that was continued in Starship Troopers, right? He had right. a similar idea in kind of how the uh, future works in terms right. of gender as kind of a gender collage, right, where you can't quite differentiate in, right. in, in a military or police. But going back to the, 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 the android, uh, the, 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 the uh, entering the machine, I have become a reactionary and, a, and a, a really a, a, a fan of Paul Virilio, who is a Catholic anarchist technophobe who thinks that the internet is the worst thing that ever happened to us. And he proposes a museum of accidents, uh, the theory being that when you invent, the when you create the Titanic, you're not thinking about the iceberg. When you create the automobile, you're not thinking about the crash. And when you create the internet, you're not thinking, so fill in the blank. Um, uh, so any of you who have not, are not familiar with Paul Virilio, he writes aphoristically like Nietzsche uh, and uh, is definitely, has a red flashing light there about the, uh, the uh, off-ramp called the future. But it's funny, even in this film, I feel that anxiety, especially about the TV, right? TJ Laser, right? Yeah. The idea that how can I be on TV to right. impress my child? Right. Uh, well, when we meet Robocop, he's on TV. Yeah. Right. And then and then he's the cameras are constantly on him. And there is this notion of mediation, right, that once he's been brought into the box or device, he has achieved that sort of fantasy figure that he wanted to be for his son, which was communicated to him through the TJ Laser parody. Damn, like, this guy's good. good. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to connect to it. <laughs> no, no, that's really good. Okay. I mean, some of these things are, are obviously, if you have read anything about <clears throat> William Burroughs cut up theory of uh, editing, he would write novels and then cut them into little pieces and put them in a bag and then paste them together. And he found a kind of narrative continuity out of this uh, random assemblage. So. Uh, going back to Eisenstein and theories about montage, um, I think that some of that meaning, you know, gets added by you uh, and the culture if, if, if we're doing our job, right? Yeah, well, I think, I think Verhoeven, you know, in his parodies subsequently, <clears throat> especially in Total Recall, uh, the idea of the memory and the screen, right? The mediation between the two. How do we remember ourselves? Well, what if we remember ourselves through technology sure. rather than through the organic memory? And in the sequence uh, when uh, Robocop or Murphy goes into his home, he uses the subtle application of the video screen, which fades away to the actual organic yeah. memory and then back up, right? Fantastic, and so that, huh? that movement is that whole concept executed in this film, very much ahead of its time. I think that's also, a, there's a, a cinematic grammar, grammar from Europe that is, yeah. is obviously more uh, Bergman and the, the new wave. Uh, played around with those things, eight and a half, with the dream yeah, sequence absolutely. where he's washing away the wall of the bedroom. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't, I think he, he, he was given permission to do that. He gave himself permission to do that, where Americans were still sort of eating um, hamburgers. Yeah, it's funny because most, the European cinema of that period of the 60s and 70s is about cinema. It's self-reflexive about cinema. This is a movie that's self-reflexive about television. There's a weird, it's a second layer, which we hadn't really seen, like with the, you know, I'd buy that for a dollar. Sure. There's all these explosions going around the gang and he's watching TV. Was that in, in this, that idea of fixation on the television? Even, yeah, even then we were, we were, we were so media saturated. And it's a very good point. Paul at one point wanted to with the media breaks pull out from the TV into the news set, blah, blah, blah. And Ed and I threw a fit because there is a first person grammar there when you just see the screen that um, uh, you're used to, that from the cradle, uh, someone's talking directly to you. And so like the narrative voices of I, you, we, uh, we felt that we could get away with a sort of I guess it would be second person, you, mm -hmm. someone looking at you, versus the third person over the shoulder grammar. So we told him not to do it, and he didn't. Yeah, I mean, it begins as a television show. We start watching the news. There's the row of TVs in the boardroom, right? right. Uh, the final co uh, confession is delivered through the kind of Robocop sure. plug yeah. into the television. So the television sets are constantly circulating through the film, even in the technology of the dream, right? He has the dream through the television set. right? So it, it really is an unusual step that you made because I don't know that a lot of films were really engaging television in that way as a kind of nefarious medium. No, um, but again, uh, I, I, I was a student of McLuhan and, and the, the also 
we could pump more narrative storylines that way. Something okay. in the background could be talking about a B story. The um, uh, data analysis with the data port uh, when, where he finds the gang. Initially, uh, we envisioned something more along the lines of uh, The Dark Knight. He was at the graveside uh, of Murphy, the cop. So, and we thought, this is like, too much like Batman. <laughs> so it led us to this other data mining, which was an early, I guess, prefiguring of uh, what we all do now. Yeah. When you were making this film, and like, how did you, like, well, how, <laughs> some apologies. When, like, how did you want it to be perceived? Like in terms of um, everything that was going on at that time, and just, you know, the we, audiences and all that stuff. We were both big fans of network and felt that uh, the, uh, again and again at the end of the Reagan era with the um, privatization of a lot of things, um, we felt that it was a, a great opportunity to spoof the power of the corporations. If you remember, Joan says, we practically are the military, um, which prefigures the Koch brothers and the, you know, all of these strange things that are happening now. Um, so that was very much on our minds. And fortunately, again, we had the mic. We had Paul. We had a studio that doesn't develop. So it was a perfect storm in which the 99% could sort of speak um, about the things that were bothering them. And it doesn't happen very often. I, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have had a part in that. Hi, Professor. <laughs> um, I had a question you talk about in your class, with as your screenwriting class here, about mythic structure. And uh, we watch a lot of Joseph Campbell. And this film, to me, seems like it's this postmodern Promethean narrative running through it. And uh, we haven't spoken much about that, so I wanted to get your response on that. Uh, really good question. In fact, uh, something that Ed, neither Ed or I had a clue about, even though we talked about Frankenstein, Paul completely hooked in on, and he, uh, uh, which was the, the Jesus myth and resurrection, um, and Boeing, of course. <laughs> but sometimes, you know, you can be in the tunnel and not understand that. But he was, he's part of this thing called the Jesus Project, which is trying to determine what Christ actually said, what he may have said, what scholars added, how the pat a patriarchal church superimposed a kind of meaning. So when he walks on water there at the end, when he kills Clarence, um, the idea of being turned back on, there were definitely resurrection motifs. And I think that was the, for him at least, for us it was Frankenstein, the man in the iron mask. Um, we, were, we were thinking more narratively um, than, than Paul was. And again, fortunately, he had this sort of depth that he hooked into. That so he really sees that as a, as a crucifixion ending, right? With the, with the kind of yeah. um, nail through the hand yeah. almost, although it's through the shoulder, but that's what he's being And crucified. I think his process uh, to get more energy as a director, he, he would take a bath in that. He would go you know, deeply into the thinking right. of that. Yeah, I'd read he was very uh, religious. Um, but yeah, in terms of the, of the mythic themes, I mean, do you think you were you were writing from a more you were writing from a more intuitive place, or were you were you, you were not reading Campbell right when you were writing this, or were you? No, I knew about Joseph Campbell, but we weren't. I mean, the classic Campbell structure via George Lucas is uh, hearing the call, refusing the call. Mad Max doesn't want to help the people. Jimmy Stewart is going to leave the town. <laughs> um, but we don't have that refusal of the call. The call sort of is pushed on our character. And I've had a number of debates with the, uh, had with the recently deceased Gil Dennis, who wrote the Johnny Cash story, uh, about two different approaches. One in which character defines plot and drives plot versus uh, character being lost in plot, uh, destiny. So I guess a, the, a debate between destiny and will. So all of you writers and directors and storytellers out there, that's, a, I think, a very fertile uh, area to mine um, you know, when you feel like your life is spinning out of control, make a film about destiny. There's also the Western. I mean, there's a lot of genres here, but the idea of the, of the mythic hero in the West who cannot live among us, the, right? It's a but very good point. I, I was thinking about that particularly yeah. when the, the guys are with the cannons and the van is behind them, that sort of high noon idea. But also, 
except for you know the jokes about Santa Barbara and the, the president and stuff. <laughs> Santa Barbara. Um, I, I'm so happy to have been in this room <laughs> when you all saw that. I'm going to tell Ed. And you killed some presidents too. <laughs> uh, but really, the film doesn't look outside of Detroit, and that's what Jose Padilla struggled with in the remake because it is a much more global world. And right. uh, just to point out, everyone who saw the first RoboCop didn't like the remake. But those who never saw the first one, China, loved RoboCop. So um, the sense of a, a closed space, a high noon, was really, we really talked a lot about that. Absolutely. Yeah, and also Detroit is almost a post-apocalyptic frontier. Sure. Right? I mean, it really is that, that idea of settling the frontier from the myth, but then you, of course, invert it. In sure, and in retrospect, you know, uh, Mitt Romney is there in Gross Point, right? Uh, making jokes about the 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 the, the ninety nine percent, just a, a couple miles away from people who are shooting deer in their backyard to survive because Detroit has turned into this sort of feral wasteland. I mean, and that was only a couple of years ago. Yeah, thirteen million was a lot of money back then. Uh, when the studio, the the UA people, finally saw the thing, how did they react to the? Um, uh, the humor uh, riff on the murder of uh, George Moscone. Uh, that was, uh, that's a very observant. We did definitely do the uh, Twinkie defense, and um, I don't think they were worried about that. They were, Mike Metavoy, uh, the, the original review by Sheila Benson in the LA Times was negative. So Metavoy called the LA Times and said, put another person on it, uh, because LA was a big market at the time. So. I don't think, and maybe now uh, it would land differently. A lot of the, I, I, I just personally find that the culture is simultaneously more sensitive and more crass. There seems to have been a split, like everything else, into a world of the politically correct, which I am completely for, by the way. I think that you have to tell people what to do or they will only work in their own self-interest, versus uh, uh, individual rights, libertarian, those, are, those things seem to be much more polarized now in this country. And so maybe the, those, those things wouldn't, corporate management would cut those things out now because of a large part, they would lose market share. I mean, it's crazy now, right? Yeah, hi, Mr. Miner. Um, I just wanted to ask you a question about the, the remake that they had a couple of years ago. I was wondering, what your thoughts were on how they handled it, and more in general, what your thoughts were on all these big Hollywood remakes being made now of 80s films? It's, it's a good question. I, I think uh, Jose did a great job, um, and I've had a big split with Ed and Verhoeven about this because their feeling ha has been protect the brand, this is a one-of-a-kind thing, but my feeling is that Robocop could operate like Batman, and every five years you could make this thing about uh, a, a character who um, um, is not um, influenced by the community that they're trying to uphold. And if you look into the oldest stories, Solon and Moses were orphans. And that made them better leaders because there was no paternal or fraternal. The community could absorb an orphan better as a leader than someone who has a vested interest in the community. So in a way, a way Robocop dies and comes back as a kind of standalone character. And uh, Jose, if you haven't seen Elite Squad 2, it's the best uh, cartel cop drama ever made by, by, in my book. I thought he did a great job. And he, he continually said, I'm not trying to remake the film. I'm making an homage. So I thought he did a great job. Hi, Professor Miner. Hey, um, so we talked about how there's a lot of different themes that are layered into Robocop and how there's only so many stories you could tell and that's why we have remakes. Uh, were there particular movies that came out after Robocop that you felt were like, um, that you kind of watched and were like, oh, that's kind of like what I wrote or it really stuck with you in terms of like it was very <laughs> Boy, I, you know, maybe this means I'm not as much of a narcissist as some people <laughs> think I am. But, I, you know, it's hard. It's sort of like, how do you do Dirty Harry in another form unless it's, you know, Unforgiven is a version of that. I don't know if we really got ripped off uh, uh, very often. Uh, if someone else can come up with an example that I, 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 I'll grab for. 
<laughs> I, I feel the influence, you know, is not so much, I mean, the character is so profound. I think I agree with you. I think it stands as an archetype on its own. I don't, but I think the, sen the comedic sensibility has been s not stolen, because it's not, but sure. has, has been highly influential. Even I, uh, the trailer for, for uh, a film like Deadpool that's coming out now, a kind of sense, a, a comedic self-aware sensibility that I had not seen prior to this film, except sure. in, say, the, the trauma films. Where, but that was again on the margins, and this was the first studio film that really had that self-awareness. And so if I were to see its lasting influence, it's just completely, science fiction and dystopian films were not funny prior to this. No. They were dark. They're, I mean, you look at Class of 1984, you must have done sure. this, which is all about the punks run wild. They, I mean, it's not funny, and, and, and even Death Wish, there's nothing really funny about it. It's, it's, it's almost a nightmare, it's treated very seriously. And this, right. and this is serious, on a lot. I don't mean to say that this is a pure comedy, right. but that sense that, that, that tonal shift between a, a playful comedy and then, and then arch drama was the legacy that I see for this film. I mean, it's carried forward as the, a defining idea. Yeah, to, to, tone is tricky. I mean, um, if you look at the Fight Club, there is again a kind of Ikea right. boy, sure. uh, a jocular quality as these, uh, this fraternal anarchist group is attempting to uh, contemplate a, their own 9-11. Um, and you couldn't make that film now. Uh, um, but I agree with you, tone, tone is tricky. I mean, Tank Girl doesn't work at all. Sure. Uh, but this one, for a number of reasons, you could probably do uh, break down and then go out and make, be successful yourself. Although the country has shifted, obviously, because of the level of violence with the, with the Gorno, with Saw, people can look a lot more at violence than they could then. This was a, you know, Ver Verhoeven was alive during World War II. And again, the argument is because of the violence in the African-American community and because of these Europeans who survived the Holocaust, their, their, their respect for violence is very different. Violence, unlike in a Tarantino film, is fast and has consequences. Where Tarantino will make a joke, uh, with, uh, make meta within the... Uh, um, execution of the violence. Uh, the, the, it's very, the, uh, very different, uh, the treatment of violence. Yeah, absolutely. I have to say, I, I didn't realize, but isn't Shell a Dutch corporation? <laughs> oh, could I, be, I, I think so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, my comment is um, the character Lewis, I mean, 1987, I mean, that's 30 years ago, and, you know, was she in the first, second, and third scripts? I mean, she was originally a female character. Right. And it's interesting how you have this amazing, strong character, and you know, like you said, you were desexualizing the military and making it more equal, which is what we have today. So right. very prophetic. At the same time, you still have some of the boardroom hijinks and the stenographer, and then the the flirtation with the secretary and the gum and everything. So you still had some of that in there. The sure. classic '80s and Working Girl was coming out at the same time. Right. But what What made you come up with Officer Lewis? Uh, we, we're very, um, th there has to be the buddy, right? And uh, we felt that it needed to be a woman because a, a, a man would have questioned so many different things or, or would have been expected to by the audience. Um, and so we th uh, sir, uh, worked a lot, many days, on the name, on, on how she looked, uh, on trying to aspire to this genderless, like the military, uh, a, a, um, a service organization where gender was not the primary uh, hierarchical structure. Um, I mean, it was happening. It just wasn't happening in, in the way it is now or should, should be happening. And, and Paul embraced that. Um, and uh, uh, I thought Nancy did a great job. Um, and again, a man in that role just doesn't, I mean, you can't imagine it, right? We just couldn't think it through or write scenes with that with a guy, right? Because there, there is a kind of, I don't want to say sexuality, but a, a relationship that when she aims for him and she recognizes the gun trick. And I think that the, the, the perceptive woman as a character is different. I don't think men are, you know, they're like, who is that? Or let's kick his ass, right? <laughs> um, so that, it had to be a woman, if that makes any sense. 
Well, this was great. Uh, I, I want to thank Michael Meyer for taking time to talk with us. And this was a huge film of my childhood. So let's all thank him very much. And thank, thank you all you for, for coming. coming. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Thanks, you did great. Great Thanks, questions, man. That was great. Thank you.